Um, so I was asked for a title to this talk and I came up with the curious life histories of Devon's butterflies. Well, they certainly are curious, but I think also actually I came to realize that they were mysterious as well and uh, wondered if I should have called it the mysterious life histories of Devon's butterflies, but nevertheless they're both curious and in some respects mysterious and I'm going to leave you with seven mysteries which you can go away and think about um, after the talk. So Simon um, kindly mentioned the book. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're all very familiar with the, we're seeing butterflies flying around outside in the summer, but um, I've always had a, a great interest in their life histories because really for most butterflies, the, the adult stage is not the stage at which they spend most of their lives. The commonest stage at which they spend the winter is the caterpillar. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the stage at which they spend the longest time in, in most cases, but of course not all. So I thought we'd just orientate ourselves with the families of butterflies to start with that occur in Devon. So this is the swallowtail um, family Papillionidae, which um, in the UK is really only resident in the fens and broads of East Anglia. But nevertheless, it's a pretty common butterfly on the continent. And from time to time, individuals do make it across the channel and turn up in Devon. And furthermore, occasionally they manage to lay eggs and, uh, and caterpillars are found, but it's, it is jolly rare. Nevertheless, with um, climate change as it's going, and if it goes on much further, then the climate in Devon could be much more conducive to these things actually establishing themselves. And this is the family Hesperiidae, the skipper butterflies. This is a female small skipper. And the family Pieridae, this is a small white, so the Pieridae is the white and yellow butterflies. Now there's a big family, the Nymphalidae, and uh, this is a female gatekeeper. So when I was um, a small boy, my mother who taught biology used to tell me that insects had six legs and butterflies were insects which I thought was curious because when I wandered around the garden looking at butterflies, most of the butterflies I saw appeared to have four legs. Um, and so that is a feature of this family, the, the Nymphalidae. So they're divided into this big subfamily, the Satyrinae, which forms these browns, the brown butterflies, and then a number of other sm smaller subfamilies which have the more um, decoratively coloured butterflies. Now, of course, insects do have six legs, but it's just that the front pair of legs in the Nymphalidae are very much reduced. They have no function in terms of walking. They may do other things, but they certainly are not involved in locomotion. So here we are, there's a mating pair of high brown fritillaries from up on Dartmoor, and you can clearly see that each butterfly has four legs. And uh, this is the much more familiar small tortoiseshell, although sadly its numbers are tiny compared with what they were a few decades ago. And we're not entirely sure why, but there is a new parasite that's arrived from the continent in recent years, and that may be at least in part responsible. And the family Lysinidae, which is the coppers, the hair streaks and the blue butterflies. This is a mating pair of small coppers on a ragwort flower in my garden. And we'll just quickly go through a life history. So this is the comma. The comma butterfly lays its eggs singly on the food plant, which may be common nettle or elm or hop. They're the principal food plants. The caterpillar hatches out and this is it in its first instar. So the first instar is the stage between coming out of the egg and shedding its first skin. And when it sheds its skin, it goes into the second instar, and then it'll grow a bit, shed its skin into the third instar, and then the fourth instar, and then the fifth instar. 
So interestingly, um, one of the butterfly books, which I think was copied into another, certainly South British Butterflies, says that the first generation of the comma has five in stars and the second generation has four in stars. Well, whenever I've read the second generation, they've always had five in stars and I don't really believe it. I don't see why this particular species would want to vary its number of instars. But of course, the trouble is, I can't say that nobody ever read it and it went through its development in four instars on at least one occasion. Uh, it's usually pretty standard, the, uh, the number of instars, but it does vary between species. The purple hair streak, for example, has four instars. Most have five. The dark green fritillary has six instars. The, the speckled wood has either four or five. So that's it's very much got um, two, two different um, growth patterns. And uh, the wood white also has certainly been demonstrated to have four in stars on occasions and five on another. So it's, um, it's, it's quite complex and it's actually very difficult, surprisingly difficult to count the in stars. And the comma, when you rear them, it's they're shedding their skin every two days. So it'd be really quite easy to overlook one of the molts. And then when it's fully grown, it hangs itself up, uh, spins a silk pad here, hangs itself to the silk pad, sheds its skin to, to reveal the chrysalis. And here's the comma butterfly. This one's overwintered as an adult. And it's emerged in the spring, and here it is nectaring on plum blossom. So this we call the normal form. And it's uh, if we look underneath, it looks like that, uh, which is very difficult to see on the uh, trunk of a tree or amongst dead leaves or whatever. So, so the generation, once they come out of the, the winter diapause, they they feed up, they mate, they lay their eggs, they go through another generation, and the next generation of butterflies appears in July. And this is the form that appears in July. So it's rather different. They call this variety Hutchinsoni. And you'll notice it's a paler color underneath and the edges are not quite as scalloped. So if we see them side by side, you can see the color difference. And you can see here in particular, the, the deeply scalloped part of the wing, which is much shallower on the summer generation. So the summer generation, the variety Hutchinsoni, become sexually mature quickly. They mate and lay eggs and produce the, this normal form again in the autumn, which will spend the winter as an adult. So this leads me on to mystery number one. And I know John Walters has told you about this in a recent talk, but um, Here's a picture of three comma butterflies. One, two, three. Overwintering on an oak tree in Decoy Woods, Newton Abbott. And the curious thing is that in the last four years, there's been comma butterflies overwintering on exactly the same place for three out of those four years. And the fourth year, nobody went to look. So it may be they were there then as well. But they must, they settle down in October and there's leaves all over the oak tree still in October. The, the, the oak won't have shed its leaves by then, but yet it chooses this particular branch, which has this, this epicornic growth in which dead leaves get caught up and is just an ideal place to uh, pretend to be a dead leaf. So that's mystery number one. How do the, the comma butterflies decide that this is the place to overwinter when the rest of the tree is covered with leaves, which are going to be shed? Now, I know John Walters has also talked to you about the um, life history of the white admiral butterfly recently, but I thought I'd do it again because he and I worked closely together on this one. And um, I'll probably give you a slightly different slant on it. So um, this is a white admiral butterfly taken at Bovey Heath. But um, some years ago, I was trying to remember, it must be 15 to 20 years ago, a chap called Barry Fox, I think it was his PhD actually, studied the white admiral butterfly and came up with some remarkable observations on the young larva. 
So John and I decided to investigate this further and we followed it up with a, another paper in the same journal, the Entomologist Gazette. But um, our findings broadly agreed with what Barry Fox had found, but there were some differences. So the White Admiral Butterfly lays its eggs in really quite deep shady woodland, and this is a typical place where it, it would be laying. So this leaf here shows feeding damage from the White Admiral. And if we crop the image, it looks as if an awful lot of leaf has been eaten away here, leaving the midrib. But in fact, as we'll see in a moment, not all that has actually been eaten. But because of the way it feeds, it does leave this characteristic feeding damage, which uh, is relatively easy to find. So again, to demonstrate how shady this woodland is, this is the middle of August, about six o'clock in the evening. You can see how light it is in the woodland ride. And here we are looking with a torch to, to find white admiral larvae. And you can also notice how scrappy this honeysuckle is that they're using. It's really very scrappy, stressed honeysuckle. So in many ways, it is a um, story of overcoming the plant's defenses. And the white admiral lays its egg, usually on the edge of a leaf of the honeysuckle. If we crop the image, it's a beautifully sculptured egg. And when the caterpillar hatches out of the egg, the first obstacle it's got to overcome, the first part of the honeysuckle's defense, it's got to negotiate these hairs. But it successfully does that and gets to the tip of the leaf. And it starts nibbling away a bit either side of the tip of the leaf. And it passes that those leaf fragments through the gut very quickly. So it's not digested properly. And you can see here, these are the frass pellets, which are just sort of a yellowy green color. So they ha really haven't been digested much. And it starts sewing them to the tip of the leaf. And so by later on, on the same day, it's sewn a lot more frass pellets together on the tip of the leaf, creating this pier extension. So Barry Fox termed it a pier, and we'll continue to use that term. And also now the frass is getting, the, the leaf fragments getting digested more, as you can see these dark pellets, some of which it's stuck to its body and some it's included in the pier. And it eats in a channel this side and it eats in a channel that side. And there it is, it's resting on this pier that it's constructed now. And then it continues with its feeding pattern. So it, it's, it's taken a leaf fragment out here and dropped it down here and suspended it with silk. And this side, it's eaten a channel in here and it's gonna cut off this flag of leaf here and drop it down and again, attach it with silk. And so the feeding pattern continues. You can see here it's now spun some silk over the midrib to make it easier to move around. It's resting on its pier. These are the leaf fragments it's dropped down and it's eating in this side now and it's gonna cut off this fragment. Uh, and here it is, the, um, it's just cut off another fragment. It's a frass pellets attached to itself. Same feeding pattern continuing. But now you can begin to see, well, you can see how covered in silk the, um, the midrib is, but now you can begin to see frass pellets appearing in amongst these leaf fragments. And so Barry Fox named this an aerial latrine. And again, we've continued to use this terminology. And now at the end of the first instar, here it is resting on its pier that it's constructed, got some frass pellets stuck to it. it almost looks as if it's got two heads. This head's about to drop off. And um, this is the new head developing behind. So it sheds a skin, its skin becomes a bit more spiky, and carries on the same old feeding pattern. But what it does, it sows the petiole of the leaf to the stem of the honeysuckle because this is really, as I say, really scrappy honeysuckle growing in the, in the dense woodland. And in August, it can get pretty dry and lots of these honeysuckle leaves fall to the ground. And of course, if the leaf it happened to be feeding on fell to the ground, that would be the end of that caterpillar. So it ensures the leaf isn't gonna fall by sowing it to the stem. 
And now it's gone into the third inner star, even more spiky, still carrying on the same sort of feeding pattern. And here it is on the midrib. Difficult to discern the difference between the, the pier and the midrib now. It's possible, I suppose, even the pier's fallen off, can't really tell. And here is the aerial latrine. So mystery number two really is, what is this aerial latrine all about? I mean, it clearly goes to significant um, trouble to build it. And also it moves it because don't forget the, the it was feeding this end of the leaf to start with. And now as the feeding edge has retracted, it's moved the latrine and it does that by cutting a strand of silk here and then hitching up this edge, this edge of the latrine with another strand of silk up to here. And that's, whoops, sorry. And that's the way in which the latrine is moved along. But as to what this is all about, a complete mystery to be quite honest with you. And then when it's fed for a while in the third instar, it prepares for the winter and it constructs itself a hibernaculum. So again, it's, it's made, the, the, the petiole is sewn to the stem so that it won't fall off during the winter. It cuts out a notch of leaf at the base of the leaf and uh, it spins a silk pad on which is resting now, you can't see. It cuts through the edge of the leaf to just beyond the midrib. And then by spinning the silk, it pulls the edge of the leaf over itself. So uh, you can imagine trying to fold that leaf without having cut that notch out. It would be much mechanically much harder. So it, it, it's remarkable really, it cuts this notch out to aid the folding. And here's a completed hibernaculum. You can see the not notch has been taken out both sides of the leaf. It's gone through past the midrib and it's folded the leaf fragment over. And here's another one. So it's not a very substantial structure in many ways, but it's not going to blow off. And uh, you can see the caterpillar inside there. And here's another one. You can see the notch has been cut away from the base, cut through beyond the midrib the leaf fragment folded over. They're not all constructed in exactly the same way. There's four different types. This is a kind of different sort of type, rather scruffier type of hibernaculum. And another one here where the entire distal part of the leaf has been cut off. And this is in the middle of winter now, and you can see all these silk strands here, but this is spider silk now. So this is just how it is in the middle of winter. And if you look carefully, you can see the very end of the caterpillar just poking out there. But, um, you know, although the petiole isn't going to get, the, the leaf isn't going to get blown off the stem, the, uh, the sides of the leaf are pretty brittle and are liable to disintegrate. And this one in the winter, the, the, the sides had just completely disintegrated really. But uh, so it just was um, exposed like that. And this one, the hibernaculum had become adherent to the honeysuckle stem and the caterpillar actually left it and was resting on the honeysuckle stem itself. And this one got through the winter perfectly well, just resting like that. And then in the spring, it wakes up, feeds a bit and then sheds its skin to go into the fourth instar, which looks like this. This is the end of the fourth instar. Again, you've got a sort of appearance of two heads really. And it sheds its skin to go into the fifth instar, which is really spectacular, but jolly hard to find, whereas the early instars are relatively easy to find. Right, and so then it hangs itself up rather like the comma does, sheds its skin and leaves this ast astonishingly shaped chrysalis from which the butterfly will emerge. So I said in many ways it was a story of overcoming the plant's defences, and when Barry Fox was doing his studies, he took some young newly hatched larvae of the White Admiral and put them on lush honeysuckle leaves growing in the woodland ride. And what happened is the 
larvae went to the tip of the leaf and they started to feed, but the honeysuckle leaves gave off this sticky substance which gummed up the larvae and they really couldn't cope with it and uh, eventually perished. So the white admiral has to use scrappy, stressed honeysuckle deep in the woodland, which can't mount these defences. But uh, here's another species, a moth this time. This is the broad bordered bee hawk moth, which we don't get in Devon, which overcomes the problem in a different way. So it does lay its eggs on the lush honeysuckle growing in the woodland ride. Leg eggs are laid singly underneath the leaf and the caterpillar when it hatches eats a hole in the leaf. And the honeysuckle leaf gives off this sticky stuff. But when the caterpillar can't cope with that, it moves to the other side of the leaf and makes another hole. And again, when the sticky stuff gets exuded and it can't cope, it comes back to the first side. And so you end up with this parallel set of um, holes either side of the midrib. And then when it's big enough, it, um, it's quite capable of dealing with the sticky stuff and eats the whole leaf. And uh, there's the caterpillar of the broad bordered bee hawk moth and uh, freshly emerged broad bordered bee hawk moth. It's a wonderful bumblebee mimic that flies by day. And in fact, these pale greyish scales here will fall off as soon as it flies and you're left with the clear wings. So sadly, we don't get this in Devon, but uh, they occur in Dorset, which is a good place to see them. Right, now, um, this is a purple hair streak, which uh, you can see in sort of second half of the summer really in uh, on the oak trees, especially on the Dartmoor woods. Um, late in the afternoon is supposed to be a good time to see them. But um, I just wanted to do a few strategies during this talk and there's um, life forms have a have 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 can have a reproductive strategy of either sort of more bearing than caring or more caring than bearing. So I think, you know, we as a species are the ultimate in caring, really. We don't have many children, but we care for them and they have a very good chance of uh, survival. Whereas the ocean going sunfish, for example, lays 300 million eggs each season and they're just cast into the ocean and each one has very little chance of survival and she doesn't care for them at all. Well, of course, butterflies don't really do much by way of caring, but for the purple hair streak does its best, really. So this is uh, the underside up in an oak tree. This is a female purple hair streak that's opened its wings. But it lays its egg right at the base of the terminal bud of oak trees. You can go up now on, you know, in the winter up on Dartmoor and, and find these eggs relatively easily. And for the size of the butterfly, the egg is really quite large, I would say. So in terms of caring, she's putting the egg just where it need, needs to be, such that the caterpillar, as soon as it comes out, can bury straight into the oak bud. And also it's given it a good deal of nutrition to start it off in life. And there's another egg, just as an aside, you'll notice this egg has got a hole in it. So this has been attacked by a parasitic wasp. So a tiny, really tiny wasp has laid its egg within the egg of the purple hair streak. And the wasp larva has eaten out the contact, contents and completed its life cycle and emerged from that hole as a fully developed adult wasp. So you can imagine how tiny it is. And there's the purple hair streak caterpillar. Um, this is in its final instar now, looking very cryptic amongst the uh, opening oak buds. Uh, just remarkable, really. Jolly hard to see. And here's a close up of uh, another caterpillar. In contrast, another butterfly you can see up on Dartmoor, the silver washed fritillary. So, this is a female silver washed fritillary. And she lays a lot more eggs, possibly five or six hundred eggs, but she doesn't even lay them on the food plant. She lays them on the trunks of trees or on moss growing on trees. And the caterpillar, when it hatches out from the egg, it just stays there, doesn't feed. It spends the entire winter where it hatched until the spring. And then it drops to the ground, having not fed at all, 
and it's got to wander off small as it is to find a violet leaf on which it can start to feed. So the silver wash fritillary goes in for a lot more bearing and little caring. This is the male silver wash fritillary. You notice these black streaks on the veins here. These are sex brands, the sort of um, cells there, andraconial cells, which give off uh, scent, which is involved in courtship. There's a pair of silver wash fritillaries, and again, you note they're walking on four legs. And the rather spectacular final instar larva of the silver wash fritillary. Now, this is a large skipper. This is a male um, because it's got this dark streak here, and that's where its andraconial cells are on this sex brand here. So the large skipper lays its eggs principally on Coxford grass. Um, I, you know, it will eat on other grasses as well. You know, I've seen at night one feeding on uh, red fescue, for example. But in terms of what we'll see it does in a moment, I think Coxford is going to be the ideal um, grass for it to be starting off life. So the principal food plant is Coxford. And here we are, you can see it's eaten away some leaf here. And although it's not very clear, it's folded this leaf over and attached it with some silk. So it's living up in a sort of tube. It's made in this leaf here. And then when it's not very big, it prepares for the winter. So it's made itself a hibernaculum out of these dead Coxford leaves. And you can see you know, it's used more than one leaf. And you can just see this bit here is some silk it's sewn and it's hiding within that where, it, where it'll spend the winter. So in the spring, um, it uh, starts feeding again and looks like this. And then it gets bigger and looks like this. Now, I want you to particularly notice um, these rear segments here. So these orangey dots are the spiracles, the breathing tubes. So that's where the oxygen diffuses in and the carbon dioxide diffuses out. There are spiracles on the first thoracic segment, which you can't actually see because the head's in the way. None on the second and third thoracic segment, then one on each of the first eight abdominal segments. So this is the last spiracle. This is the eighth segment. This is the seventh segment. And it's just all green here. So this is the final instar. But later, during this instar, it develops this white stuff here. OK. And. Uh, we can crop the image a bit and you can see this white stuff more clearly. So this is a waxy substance which the caterpillar secretes. And curiously, the textbooks make little of it. Um, in fact, many a textbook will just mention it on the silver spotted skipper, which has got a much darker coloured lava than that. And so the white, the white waxy stuff is more contrasting. So many a butterfly book doesn't even mention it. Some of them do. And in fact, all the skippers in the subfamily, the Hesperiani, so that'll be the large skipper, silver spotted skipper, small skipper, Essex skipper and Lulworth skipper, they all have this white waxy stuff, but it's generally not mentioned. And mystery number three is what's it all about? So this is a cocoon now of the large skipper. Butterflies in general don't make cocoons, but uh, some of these skippers, in particular the large skipper here, certainly does. I mean, you, that's clearly a cocoon. It's spun, spun out with silk between leaf blades, and you can see at this end, there's this cotton woolly, like white fluffy stuff. So this is the white stuff that was on the rear end of the caterpillar, but this is the head end of the cocoon. So if we... Um, really focus in on the head end of the cocoon, you can see what it looks like. So for some reason, it secretes this stuff at the rear end of the caterpillar, deposits it at the head end of the cocoon. But we haven't got a clue what it's all about. So that is the next mystery. Mystery number three. And that's the chrysalis 
of the large skipper. And the skipper butterflies have a very long proboscis, which they can get into flowers with quite deep corolli. So normally on a chrysalis, the developing proboscis is enclosed in part of the case which goes between the wing cases and ends up out here. But in the skippers, it's got this extra projection, which isn't an integral part of the rest of the pupa, this extra projection for the proboscis to develop because it's so long. And here we are, we've got a pair of small skippers now. And here's a small skipper caterpillar. Again, you can see with this white waxy stuff that's developed under the seventh and eighth abdominal segments. The Lulworth skipper, the Lulworth skipper we don't get in Devon. It's uh, Dorset is its home. There are old records from a very long time ago around in the Sidmouth area, but they certainly don't occur in Devon anymore. This is the caterpillar of the Lulworth skipper. And again, you've got this white waxy stuff under the seventh and eighth abdominal segments. And if we uh, um, take a photo a cl real close up, you can, you can see it more clearly. You can scrape the stuff off with a pin. I mean, it's not stuck on very hard at all. It's, uh, you know, it's just, um, it's just weird. And this is a different subfamily of the skippers now. This is the grizzle skipper. So I thought I'd just touch on the grizzle skipper because it lays its eggs on the underside of rosaceous plants. Not every rosaceous plant, but a variety, but um, a, a good selection of them. This is on agrimony now. The caterpillar feeds on the agrimony leaves, or it might be wild strawberry, barren strawberry, even bramble if it's growing on the ground. And it spins the leaflet together and lives within. So there's one typical spinning. There's another one there by the looks of things. And if we open it up, there's the caterpillar of the grizzle skipper inside. Now the eggs are laid in May, and you can find these caterpillars almost fully grown still in roughly the middle of August. So it grows, they grow very slowly. It's not like the uh, comma that sheds its skin every two days. They grow very slowly. I don't know why that is, but you can imagine maybe it's a mechanism for overcoming the plant's defences. If the plant had some toxins within the leaves and the grizzle skipper caterpillar may be able to cope with it simply by just eating it slowly, not too much at a time. That's pure speculation. I really don't know, but it does have a curiously long um, larval period for something that's completing its development in one season. Now we're back to this swallowtail again. This, these pictures were all taken in Europe actually, but you know, any swallowtail that you can just, this migrates over and you see in Devon, if you're lucky enough, would be of the continental form anyway. So the young caterpillar looks a bit like a bird dropping really. So that's kind of its defense when it's small. But when it's big, it's um, really quite brightly colored, really quite warningly colored really. And, um, but if a predator did approach it, it's got another trick up its sleeve. And that is it shoots out this structure here which is known as an osmaterium. So the osmaterium comes out from the first thoracic segment and it's said to give off an acrid smell. But to my mind, that's a pretty good mimic of a snake's forked tongue. I haven't got time to go into snake mimicry at length today, but I think snake mimicry is actually quite widespread amongst our caterpillars. And birds are hopping around at high speed and if there's any chance that that's a snake, they've got to make a very quick decision and flee. And the, I can imagine the visual cue would work far, far more quickly than waiting for molecules to diffuse off this structure into the bird's nostril. So although this acrid smell may be part of the defense, I would have thought the instantaneous um, visual cue of this forked tongue appearance would scare off any bird. So 
<clears throat> now we're going to look at a, another case of different strategies, really. Uh, that is either solitary living or communal living as caterpillars. So this is the brimstone butterfly. On the top, we have a male, which is yellow, and the female below, which is a sort of greenish white color. There's a close up of the female. So she lays her eggs singly on the food plant. So in Devon, the food plant is Alder Buckthorn, which is a tree of heathland, really. So you can see it on our lowland heaths and up on parts of Dartmoor. Elsewhere in the country, it'll also feed on buckthorn. We don't really get that in Devon. And you can go up uh, to Dartmoor or on Buffy Heath or wherever you want to go in June and look on the uh, Mulder buckthorn leaves. And these caterpillars just rest completely exposed on the top of the leaf. I suppose it's a green caterpillar or a green leaf, but they are fully exposed, but there's only one at a time. So if a bird did come across one and decide to eat it, it only gets one of that female's progeny. The peacock butterfly, by contrast, lays a batch of eggs on its food plant, which is common nettle. And there's a batch of partly grown peacock caterpillars. So you think, well, heck, if a bird did predator or whatever predator it is she com comes along and finds that lot and is able to, to take them, then it would take the whole lot and all the eggs really were in one basket. But of course, if you look at the um, silk that they've spun there, you know, there is protection by, as a group, being able to spin this significant uh, silk tent in which you can hide. And also when they're on the outside, if, um, if they're approached and they're resting, they can often give a sort of quick jerky movement, uh, which may be enough to, to frighten off a predator. So there we are, different strategies again. There's plenty of brimstone butterflies, plenty of peacock butterflies, just as there are plenty of uh, silver wash fritillaries and plenty of uh, purple hair streaks. It's just different strategies in the fight for survival. Here we are as a final instar peacock caterpillar munching away at this nettle leaf here. And again, the caterpillar hangs itself up, sheds its skin to leave this um, quite smart pupa behind. Now, another strategy um, is whether you, as a caterpillar, you feed by day or feed by night. So this is a high brown fertility and uh, these are the sex brands here again on the high brown fertility. High brown fertility is Britain's most um, rapidly declined butterfly and Dartmoor does happen to be one of its strongholds but um, yeah it's very sad how it's declined. I could uh, see them not far from my home in East Devon when I was growing up but uh, I'd have to go to Dartmoor now to see them in this county or, or up on, uh, on uh, Exmoor. So there's the underside of the high brown fritillary, very similar to the dark green fritillary, especially on the top side, but the high brown fritillary has got this row of brown dots here, which the dark green fritillary doesn't have. And here's the uh, mating pair that I showed you earlier again. Now, two or three years ago, I was lucky enough um, walking up on a tour to chance upon a high brown fertility, which was out, a uh, caterpillar, which was out in the open. And uh, it was there sunning itself. And when it moved, it moved really quickly. And uh, of course, the bracken here, the dead bracken fronds, are really good at absorbing the sun's rays because they're a dull and dark colour and they heat up the micro environment down there. So making it really warm place for the high brown fertility. So it can move quickly to hunt around looking for its violet plants, which aren't everywhere. We probably don't have to go that far to find the next plant, but it does have to move. And it can eat quickly. And you know the, the, the heat from the sun will aid digestion. But 
by feeding out in the open by day, of course, it's exposing itself to avian predators. Uh, although, you know, it's, uh, it's they've got to find it. And it's relatively cryptic where, where, where it lives amongst the dead bracken fronds. But so that's the pros and cons of that particular strategy, really. And here's a close up of the caterpillar. I just couldn't stop taking photos of it, really, because uh, it's a rare event to find such a thing. But in contrast, so we're still in the family Nymphalidae, although this is the subfamily Satyrinae now, which is the browns, like the gatekeeper we saw earlier. This is the marbled white. So the um, caterpillars in this subfamily, the Satyrinae, the browns and the marbled white, they feed at night and they hide by day down at the base of grass tussocks. And they feed on grasses. But if you go out at night with a torch in the spring, you can quite easily find the caterpillars. And this is a caterpillar of the marbled white, and you can see that it's been eating away at the grass blades. But it's quite sluggish, really. But it's not going to be, it hasn't got the sun's rays to help it now. It moves in a rather sluggish fashion and feeds, well, really quite slowly and has to hide away by day uh, at the base of the grass tussocks. But it doesn't have the avian predators to bother too much about because they'd find it, they, the birds would find them difficult to find hidden away in the base of the tussocks and they're just not out at night. There may be other um, vertebrate predators, small mammals and so on, but uh, they've escaped the birds. Now we're on the family Lysinidae. So most species in the family Lysinidae have some sort of relationship with ants in their early stages. And this is the large blue butterfly, which became extinct in Britain in the 1970s. The last place it was ever, the native population was ever seen was on Dartmoor actually. And I don't think the Dartmoor colony was ever a very good colony, but it just happened to be the, 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 the last place it was seen. And then Butterfly Conservation with Partners did uh, undergo a project to reintroduce it. So it was introduced to the Dartmoor site where it persisted for a few years, but, but no longer. However, the reintroductions are in Somerset and the Cotswolds have been much more successful. And you can, you can go and see these butterflies there. So the large blue has a, is utterly dependent on, on ants and even a particular species of ant called Myrmica salbuleti. So the eggs are laid on marjoram or wild thyme, usually wild thyme, and the young caterpillar feeds within the flower heads of the thyme until a certain stage. And then when really still quite small, it attracts these ants. And after the ants attended it for a while, the ants pick up the caterpillar they take it back to their nests. And the large blue caterpillar then spends the rest of its life feeding on the ant larvae. So it's what we call a kleptoparasite, a sort of parasite within the ant's nest. And uh, it, it spends the winter there, pupates within the ant's nest, and then emerges the following summer. The Alcon blue which is not a British species, occurs in Europe, takes it one stage further, and the ants actually feed the Alcon blue larva, just like they do their own larvae. So it's extraordinary parasitism. But uh, there are other species, as I say, which um, have associations with ants, which we can easily observe. So this is the green hair streak, which is a pretty common butterfly up on Dartmoor. It's, it's pictured here on common bird's foot trefoil, and another one on bluebell. And here's a caterpillar that's feeding on common bird's foot trefoil. Lovely looking thing. And here's another one feeding on a gorse flower. And then it pupates on the ground. And people have found these pupae of green hair streaks in ants' nests. And the pupa has these um, structures 
comb-like structures, I, I guess, between the abdominal segments, which, which it can just slightly move together to make a sound. And uh, that seems to call the ants. And I'll just run this video now, and you should see the ants dragging the green hair streak pupa. So um, if you hold the pupa up to your ear, you can actually hear this noise. You can't hear it otherwise, but if you hold it right up to your, close to your ear, you can hear quite a noise. So we are the say, ant dragging the pupa. So clearly I'm only watching it for a few minutes and filming it here for a few seconds, but you can imagine over the course of uh, several hours, the ants would be certainly quite capable of moving that pupa into their nest. So the pupa would certainly get protection from the ants by being there, but um, quite whether the ants get anything out of it, I don't know. And so one can only imagine that this noise that the, that the um, green hair streak pupa is making is some form of communication with the ants. So the... Um, common blue now, so this is the male common blue and the female common blue. So the female has these orange spots around the edge of the wing. They're usually pretty brown actually with a variable amount of blue. Sometimes it's only a faint dusting of blue scales near the base of the wing. This one's quite extreme really in the amount of blue it's got. It's not normally like that. And there's a mating pair. And they lay their eggs singly on the food plant, which is plants like um, common bird's foot trefoil here, or rest harrow is another one. And uh, the egg hatches out. Here's the egg that's hatched. And the caterpillar sticks its front, it makes a hole in the leaf, sticks its head inside and eats out the parenchyma in the middle of the leaf, leaving the upper and lower epidermis intact. So that's known as mining the leaf. So that's what it does, you know, in the first instar soon after hatching out. So if you find these signs, that's typical feeding damage of the first instar common blue caterpillar. But just a word of warning, similar feeding damage is caused by this. So this is the larval case of a micro moth now called Coleophora discordella. So the Coleophora species make cases in a variety of ways. This one's made its case out of leaf fragments. So that's these uh, frilly bits are the sort of upper or lower epidermis of the, of the bird's foot trefoil leaf. And it's spun them together with silk and the darker bits are made of uh, silk incorporated. So you can see here, it's made a hole in the leaflet and again, mined out the leaf. So similar feeding damage. And then when it's in its final instar, that's what the common blue caterpillar looks like. So just to orientate ourselves, we've got um, the spiracles here. So that's the spiracle on the seventh segment, the seventh abdominal segment, I should say, and the eighth abdominal segment here, spiracles. But you've also got here this gland here, known as Newcomer's gland. And you've got these white spots here, which are the sites of tentacle organs. So the uh, common blue caterpillar is covered in microscopic glands called pore cupola, which give off sugars and amino acids, which the ants like to take. And this gland, this newcomer's gland, gives off sugars, which again the ants feed on. And these tentacle organs come out, and we don't know really what they're all about. Uh, this, in fact, is the next mystery. So let's see again. Oh yes, there we are. So we've got another image. So we've got the newcomer's gland there and the tentacle organs here. Okay. And so the ants um, tend the caterpillar like this. This one might be after secretions from the porcupola, and this one's certainly on newcomer's gland. And of course, the, um, the ants are benefiting, getting these nutrients from the caterpillar. And the caterpillar is benefiting because it's getting prote protection from some predators by the presence of the ants. So mystery number four is what are the tentacle organs all about? Now, this is another video. So you have to watch carefully. In this region here, you'll see, you'll actually see a drop of liquid coming out of newcomer's gland and taken by the ants. 
Then later on, you will see the tentacle organs appearing here in this region and the ants reacting to it. Right, did you see that? So if I drag it back, I'll try and take it through just very slowly. You see that drop of liquid appearing, a clear drop of liquid there. Right? There are clear drop of liquid, yeah. The yeah, ant's taken it. Just do that once more. So we are clear drop of liquids just appearing now, taken by the ant. So keep an eye out just in front of the head of the ant. There you go. Okay. So do you see that? So it was the tentacle organs appearing. They're like chimney sweeps brush really, and the ants clearly reacted to it. We'll just, I'll just drag it slowly like I did just now. So here we are, it's the tentacle organs appearing. And see the, the filaments at the end, just like a chimney sweeper's brush, and off goes the ant. There we are, tentacle organ. I'll just let that run again. So that's mystery number four. What are the tentacle organs all about? It's clearly some sort of communication with the ants. It's maybe olfactory. We just do not know. Right, brown argus butterfly now. So the brown argus butterfly uh, traditionally fed on rock rose in the larval stage, but I think probably always did take um, some of the geraniums, wild geraniums, that's dove's foot crest craved Dove's foot crane's bill and cut leaf crane's bill in particular. But um, more recently, the brown arga seems to have expanded its range. It's moved more inland and it's um, far more prone to using these geraniums. But they're annual plants, which really does pose a problem. So however the brown argus is managing, it's rather doing it rather well. So mystery number five is how does it work? Because the, um, this is the caterpillar. So the brown argus overwinters as a small caterpillar, then it feeds up in the spring and produces butterflies in May, June. They lay their eggs and then we see butterflies again at the end of August, beginning of September. But uh, two or three years ago, I was up at Orley Common at the end of August, beginning of September. And there were lots of brown argus butterflies flying around actually. Um, but the weird thing was, there was no food plant whatsoever. The thing is, that, as I say, they are, these are annual plants and they just die off in the summer and seeds germinate in the autumn. And there's no way there was any of the crane spills there. I looked and looked and looked and they just were not there. So how does the brown argus manage? Does it drop its eggs somewhere and hope that a crane spill has appeared? Um, do they survive long enough as butterflies to, for, for some of the eggs to be laid on just germinating seedlings? I don't know. I really don't know. But I think one thing that I suspect happens, although I, I can't prove it. And this is through my lifetime of rearing lots and lots and lots of caterpillars, especially of moths, that species where we consider have two generations a year, very often that second generation is a partial generation. In other words, some individuals go through a one year life cycle. And so, and so other generate, and other individuals go through um, two generations a year. So it may be the, that some of the caterpillars resulting from the eggs laid in May and June feed up slowly to produce this second generation in August, September, whereas others feed up very slowly and over winter as a larva without producing that second generation. And maybe that's how they manage to uh, survive in an area where there's no food plant when the second generation's around. It's pure speculation, 
but it is a bit of a mystery. So that's mystery number five for you. And uh, it's interesting to see here, this is on rock rose, how much like a rock rose leaf the larva looks. It's the same sort of shape as a rock rose leaf, and it's got these sort of whitish hairs, just like a rock rose leaf. As you can see here, it's got a eucumus gland. The side view of the larva. And here's one being well tended by ants, very attractive to ants, just as uh, the uh, just as the common blue was. I'll just run a video. Sorry, the, the much of the larva written in focus, but the it's uh, it's not too bad at the rear end where the ants are acting. So the tentacle organs aren't quite as a you know, there's one there, look. So they're not as bright white or quite, quite as big, I don't think, as with the common blue. But, you know, there, there we are. You saw that then. The tentacle organ came out and the ant reacted to it. Oh, there we are. There it goes again. Tentacle organs. Yeah. And the ants reacted again. Right. Now, next to the large blue in terms of a close relationship with ants in this country is the silver studded blue. So this is a silver studded blue butterfly male, and it has a very close relationship with ants. So mystery number six now. So the, the silver studded blue lays its eggs, not necessarily on the food plants. I mean, what are the food plants? Well, it's things like heather and gorse and common bird's foot trefoil. But the eggs are often laid on stones or on bracken and it spends the winter in the egg stage. But in the spring, the caterpillar hatches out and in captivity, it's been noticed that ants pick up these caterpillars straight away and take them into their nests. So we do not know what happens to the caterpillars then. Whether they feed on sort of roots, parts of root structure of the food plants that are growing through ants' nests, or whether the ants would take them above ground to feed and then take them back into their nests, I don't know, it's, it's very odd. We really, really don't know, but it's clearly a very close relationship. And one can only assume that that happens in the wild as well, but there's no real reason to think that it doesn't. And this is a final instar larva of the silver studded blue. It's got its newcomer gland, newcomer, newcomer's gland here. It's got the, the spiracles, these little white dots here, and you can see the tentacle organs here are really very well developed. And uh, here's one which has shot its tentacle organs out. You can nicely see the sort of chimney sweep brush type appearance. And if we crop the image, that's what they look like. So it's, um, it's just interesting, a nice view of Newcomer's gland there. So we'll run this video now. And so the caterpillar's on the move. These are the tentacle organs, which it keeps on shooting out. But uh, you'll notice a different reaction that the ants have to this larva. So, you know, there must be some communication between the larva and the ant, and you'll see what happens. So there we are, the tentacle organs coming out, the ants very much in attendance, buzzing around the caterpillar. There we are, tentacle organs coming out. Ants really interested. Caterpillar having a wonder. Now look, it's grabbed hold of the caterpillar. So I didn't see this with any of the other species. It's really dragging that caterpillar. It's going to drag it off to its nest. So the caterpillar has 
I reckon, has somehow communicated with the ant to, in, to, for want of a better word, ask it to take it to its nest. So the, uh, the silver-studded blue larva can get protection from the ants, and the ants get uh, food from the larva. And uh, it's such a close relationship that clearly the caterpillar pupates within the ant's nest. And people who've seen newly hatched silver studded blue caterpillars, they're attended by ants. So the ants are evening, even attending the, the butterflies once they've emerged and are drying their wings. Right, mystery number seven now. You won't see this in any textbook. You won't even see it in my textbook because uh, it's so mysterious that, uh, and I really, really don't know what's going on. I couldn't, I didn't feel I could write about it. So this is the female holly blue now. So the female holly blue has got this dark um, border to the wing, whereas the male's entirely blue. And there's the underside of the holly blue looking very different from the underside of the common blue. The holly blues tend to fly up around bushes, whereas the common blues tend to fly cl close to the ground. But this one was in the Buffy Valley woodlands, flying up and down this wet area, but it would only ever settle on this bird dropping and it was feeding from it, clearly getting some sort of minerals that it wanted. And uh, many a textbook will tell you that the first brood of the holly blue larvae feed on, on holly rather, um, the holly berries, flower and berries, and the second brood on ivy. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, holly blues are seen egg-laying on all sorts of different plants. Pyracanthus is an example, but nobody has ever found a caterpillar on pyracanthus as far as I'm aware. They've been seen in this country egg-laying on heather, but nobody's ever found a caterpillar. Nevertheless, on, in, in Europe, caterpillars have been found on heather and they're bright pink. And they've also been found in Europe on purple loosestrife and they're bright pink. Um, when I was um, researching for the caterpillar book, I, um, I, I asked for the larval data from the National Butterfly Database to see what, they, what people have found the caterpillars on. And there were 200 larval records and every single one was on ivy. But uh, I, I suppose maybe they're relatively easier to find on ivy. But most butterflies don't eat a wide variety of food of plants. The peacock, for example, it we call monophagus. It only feeds on one plant, that is common nettle. Um, other species, uh, maybe the common blue we could take as an example, is oligophagus. It just feeds on a small variety of closely related plants, whereas I think unusually the holly blue is surprisingly polyphagous for a butterfly. Many moths are polyphagous, feeding on a huge variety of different plants, but it's not so common in butterflies. And I've even found a caterpillar this feeding on a willow leaf. It actually produced a butterfly that was very diminutive and didn't set its wings properly, so it may be that that, that wasn't a suitable food plant for it. But um, there's, uh, they certainly feed on gorse flowers, and this one here is feeding on ivy flower buds. So although the caterpillar itself is very difficult to see, it's, it gives its presence away by leaving these holes in the ivy flower buds. And here's another one, different colour form. And this one was gave its presence away by this ant. So it was the ant that I noticed first. And you can see newcomers gland there, these eaten out flower buds. But this was on the Isles of Scilly now. There's no holly there, or at least I couldn't find any. Um, and uh, so the first generation clearly isn't using holly. And this was laid not on a gorse flower bud, but on a, a, a young gorse shoot. So presumably the larva would have managed to, uh, to feed in this. But of course, without actually observing it, you can't be certain it's going to successfully complete its development. Again, this was on the Isles of Scilly, this empty eggshell here, and there's the first in the star larva. And this is a bramble flower bud now, and it's eaten a hole in it there. It doesn't go inside, um, but it's very difficult, and I'm not convinced 
that they, they're going to successfully complete their development here because you're going at night and this bramble patch is just plastered with invertebrate predators. So um, I think they would have little chance of success. So I think, to my mind, there's a lot of mystery attached to the um, habits of the holly blue larvae. But there's one particular mystery, um, this mystery number seven I want to tell you about. This caterpillar was feeding on the fruits of dogwood. So it's commonly people see them laying eggs on dogwood, but they don't commonly see the caterpillars on dogwood. But nevertheless, I found this one on dogwood and you can see a little white patch there. So it's eaten out the contents of this developing fruit and it's sown, well, I shouldn't say it has, but there is this um, pad of silk now over the hole, okay? So, and when I find them larvae on ivy in the late summer, early autumn, again, where I very, very often, if not usually, where I find the holly blue larvae and the holes been eaten out, there are often holes that are covered with this pad of silk. Now this silk pad is spun from the outside because it overlaps the outer edge. And if you open this, flower bud up, there's nothing inside. The contents have been eaten out. There's no lava of anything inside and no egg that, of anything that I can see inside. Um, so it's, it's very odd. And I brought one into captivity to see what would happen, but no silk pad appeared, just the holes in the buds. So I'm not even certain that it's the holly blue that's doing this. And I can't think why the holly blue would cover a hole where it's eaten out the contents with silk. I mean, it's expensive stuff, silk. So if it's not the holly blue, what has done it? I really, really cannot think what's going on here. So do have a look and see if you can work it out. And then finally, the Painted Lady, which is a mystery solved, really. So the Painted Lady uh, this time of year is down in North Africa and it's breeding down in North Africa. And then probably in a, in a oh, I don't know, two or three weeks time, maybe a little more, they'll start flying northwards and uh, breeding in Southern Europe. And then by about April, a generation will start uh, appearing in Southern England. So these are tremendous migrants, really. And they come here and they lay their eggs principally on thistles, but some other plants like burdock will be used. And this is the caterpillar of the Painted Lady. And uh, the numbers can build up. And um, so that the substantial numbers of butterflies around in the autumn. But nobody ever saw Painted Ladies get moving south leaving our shores, they, you know, Red Admirals often do this. Red Admiral will overwinter here now, but uh, traditionally they were, they, they migrated back to the continent and no doubt some still do. And people could see them moving, but nobody ever saw painted ladies moving back to Europe. So it was a complete mystery what happened to them. And nobody ever found them overwintering in this country either. But in very recent years, some vertical radar has solved the problem. And in fact, they are traveling back in the autumn to Europe and heading on their way back to North Africa, but they're doing so on average between 200 and 400 meters up in the air. And so that's why we couldn't see them. So that's the mystery solved. And just I'm just going to finish off now with a pretty picture of the marsh fritillary, which uh, we do have some colonies on Dartmoor. It's now so rare that it's got full legal protection, but I did come across a um, short note in one of the entomological journals written in the 1950s, describing it as one of the commonest butterflies in Northwest Devon. So you can see how things change. So I'm going to stop there and stop sharing. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Larry, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, I hadn't, uh, I know a little bit about butterflies, but obviously I didn't really realise most of the things that you've told us there. In fact, um, all news to me, and I'm sure news to most of us. Um, John has been collecting, I hope, questions, and I'm going to hand you over to John. Um, if we can uh, bring him back on the screen, we'll be good. Let's do that. Thanks, Barry. That was uh, yeah. thanks, Simon, and thanks, Barry. That was absolutely fascinating and. 
so many different insights into the life cycle. A um, few questions here. What winter temperatures can hibernating caterpillars survive? This is from PF. <laughs> well, I can't give you a number, I'm afraid, but they're clearly very good at it. Um, you know, there are the um, Scotch Argus butterfly, for example, is overwintering as a caterpillar in northern Scotland. So, I mean, I guess underneath the snow, it might be slightly warmer than it, than it is outside. But um, yeah, I mean, they, they must be coping with temperatures in the minuses. Hmm. But I, I, I can't I, I can't give you a figure, I'm afraid. There's no correlation between particularly cold winters and uh declines in species well i think um i think cold winters can be good, good for some species i mean i think you know it's uh, there's winners and losers with most things that go on you know if there are if it's a cold winter there'll be fewer active predators for example yeah. and you know these things are able to survive pretty low temperatures i mean you know it, it uh, the um the the Scotch Argus may be somewhat protected under its layer of snow, but, uh, you know, the, the White Admiral, although it's living in Devon, I mean, we do get some pretty cold temperatures and it's sort of, you know, hanging off a honeysuckle stem. Yeah. So they clearly can cope with it. Beast from the east, etc. Yeah. Um, this, uh, I've got one here from uh, Rosie. Um, uh, uh, she requires identification. If I... Uh, find you, Rosie, and uh, see whether I can allow a screen share. Um, I'll make you co-host, and uh, if you, Rosie, if you uh, share your screen there at the bottom. Or the top if you're on an iPad. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Can you do that? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Oh, right. Yes. Ah. That's a magpie moth. Ah. Yeah. On a tyre. On a tyre, yes. Oh, it's a moth. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's got a, it's, a, you know, it's warningly coloured. It's distasteful to birds and advertising that. And the, the caterpillars are warningly coloured as well. And they, they, you may find them on current bushes or, uh, plants like blackthorn or in Scotland they're utterly abundant on heather so yeah yeah that's why that's why I saw it in Scotland yeah yeah very common up there oh well thanks for that okay <laughs> solved my mystery <laughs> mystery solved <laughs> how, do I, how do I stop doing this then I just press stop share I guess stop share that's it yep cool. thank you thanks Rosie that's great Okay, the technology works. This is from Simon. Uh, is the decline of blues uh, lichen? Lycenidae. Lycenidae, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Simon. Um, uh, relative to the decline of ant species, uh, or is it another reason? Gosh, well, that's a very good question. Um, I think... Uh... The, the blue butterflies used to do much better than they do now. And what really did for them was myxomatosis because the rabbits prevented the scrub growing up and uh, they kept the turf short, which is what particularly for the large blue was really important because these their host ant needs really warm conditions. And uh, so... I mean, I, I think for... for the large blue is particularly associated with this one one species of ants. It was very vulnerable. I mean, it's such a, you know, complicated and, you know, evolutionary dead end, if you like, of a life cycle. It's going to be very vulnerable. Mm. I mean, I think I, I think these other species um, that attract ants aren't necessarily so so hitched to one species, and so I think you know, as with everything, it's multifactorial. So I don't think it's, the, it's ants per se that um, have, cr have created much of the decline. It's, uh, you know, the plants getting shaded out over, you know, too much nitrogen in the, in the atmosphere and the, the food plants getting shaded out, that sort of thing, loss yeah. of habitat, 
and yeah. uh, and the and the um, the myxomatosis certainly did in for a lot of the blue butterflies. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, are caterpillars producing silk in the same way as spiders? This is Linda. No. <laughs> now I should elaborate, shouldn't I? Well, the, the, the caterpillars are producing it from a spinneret, which is part of the mouth parts, whereas the spider's producing it from the rear end, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And spiders so, produce different types of silk, don't they? Yes, they do. I yeah. don't know whether caterpillars do. Well, that's a good question. Um, I suspect the silk from all different species isn't exactly the same. Yeah. But uh, one, one thing the caterpillars can do to their silk is to secrete a chemical onto it to make it hard, right. like that Coleophora discordella case. Um, you know, it, it was there was a lot of silk in there, but it sil silk which something had been secreted on to, yeah. to make it hard. And, you know, when you get to the puss moth, it chews up bark and mixes it with silk to cover to make its cocoon, mm -hmm. which is really, really hard. You can't easily, well, you can't break it just by pressing on it with a finger. And, uh, and that's just silk that's been hardened by mm -hmm. a chemical. Right. So yes, so, so essentially the, the silk of caterpillars and spiders is not produced in the same way. Okay. What's the law about catching butterflies and collecting eggs, larvae and pupa? Um, well, there are certain there species you're not allowed to uh, collect. They have full legal protection, like the marsh um, fritillary and so on. But uh, other species, um, such as the uh, the white butterflies, for example, have have no legal protection as far as, as, far as I know. Mm. I mean, clearly, one doesn't want to do them any harm, and uh, you know, one just needs to to study them and let them go. Unless you're a gardener, of course. If you're a gardener, yeah. Veg vegetable gardener, yeah. So, um, uh, Tom Morris says, just to say what stunning photos. Such clarity, thank you. I'll be looking over the recording and learning lots. <laughs> so, yeah, about macro photography. Yeah, I should think, yeah. So, um, yeah, and uh, I think we're all, we all echo that. So, those are the questions. Back to you, Simon. Yeah, indeed. Well, Barry, thank you so much. It was an excellent talk. And, and, and thank you again for, for dropping in at short notice and, and uh, um, producing a, a, a very detailed and very informative uh, presentation. And we're already getting positive feedback coming in, as you could probably see. So thank you so much.